to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to have a wonderful conversation about Alice's Clubhouse, and I can't wait to tell you all about that. But before, before I introduce our guest today, I always like to just give a shout out to all of our listeners. I want to thank you so much for following us and liking and sharing these episodes. It's so important to be able to get these resources and ideas out to people all around the world. It's just a, a very, very powerful, powerful set of tools, I think, that is, is extremely useful for, for all. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you continue to like and click and share. For those of you that are new, my own mother had dementia for um, 30 years. And so it was really quite um, quite the journey, uh, one that, you know, had me go through a full uh, bout of emotions from guilt and isolation and frustration and um, exhaustion. And yet I was able to come out the other side and really find that purpose and joy and passion. And uh, it was life changing for me. And, and that's why I switched careers. And I'm here today doing what I'm doing. So again, thank you for joining us. I always like to shout out to a few um, organizations that I think are really doing great work. Um, one is the Memory Cafe Directory. If you are looking for a wonderful support group that doesn't feel like a support group, really feels more like some peers that understand, go to memorycafedirectory.com. There you will find a list of um, communities that are hosting these memory cafes throughout the U.S. and they are now developing directories um, for other countries as well. If you are a memory cafe and aren't listed in there, please go to that site, again, memorycafedirectory.com, and they will list you for free. It's just a wonderful, easy route to connect with people that understand. Another one is the World Dementia Council, which I wasn't familiar with up until about a month ago. Um, when Maria Shriver's group uh, reached out to me and said, hey, these guys are doing cool work and you need to know about them. And so they are doing a survey about dementia-friendly movements and programs around the world, and they would love you to participate. They're trying to gather research, but if you are not research-based, they still want to hear from you on what you think is working or not as an organization. And then many people don't know that uh, Alzheimer's Disease International puts out a world Alzheimer's report every year as well. And that was just, just came out in September. You can find um, all of those links on our main page at alzheimerspeaks.com. So just go there. And one other one I wanna mention is Stall Catchers, which is a game that you can play. And you know, kids as little as six and, and adults as, in their 90s are playing this game. And when you play the game, it actually analyzes real life data. So check out uh, stallcatchers.com to, to play the game. And if you're a business, you might not know, but Alzheimer's Speaks can help you expand your brand footprint by leveraging our content platforms uh, so that people know that you're out there. And I am going to be doing a little traveling this month. So uh, tomorrow, um, actually, I'm going to be at Artist Scenery Living in Brick, New Jersey. I'd love to see and meet you there. Um, and October 16th and 17th, I will be at Artist Senior Living of Elmhurst in Illinois. Uh, those programs will be one for family and one for professionals. And then back on October 19th, I'll be... Um, with Deep Haven Woods of Minnesota. They are actually located in Minnetonka and they're going to be doing a screening of A Timeless Love, which used to be called His Neighbor Phil. And that will be held at St. Luke's Presbyterian Church in Minnesota. 
And if you want more details, again, just, just reach out to me. I can get you that or go directly to, to those companies. Well, let's get to our guest today. I am going to be talking today with uh, Diane Sancho, and she is the executive director of Alice's Clubhouse. Now, Alice's Clubhouse is a memory care daycare center outside of Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Diane holds her master's of social work, and she is truly on a mission to make the lives of those living with dementia and those who care for them much, much easier. She has spent many years working with families and caregivers that understand um, their, their journey, the, the burnout that they can go through, and so many other factors that they face every day on this path with dementia. So welcome, Diane. How are you doing today? Very good, Lori. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I am really excited to, to have you on the show. And um, before I get into my line of questioning, I always like to ask if you have been personally touched in your circle of friends or family by dementia. Uh, yes, I have. Um, I come to the position of uh, working in uh, the geriatric field and specifically with dementia because my mother and my grandmother also uh, had a diagnosis of dementia. So when I was in my 40s, um, I decided to go back to school and um, study social work and specifically geriatrics. Um, I was uh, always involved in working in nursing homes and had started out as a volunteer and um, I just felt that there had to be a better way uh, to take care of individuals who had the diagnosis of dementia. So I've had it within my family, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and my mother and grandmother. So I, I certainly come to it from a personal experience as well. Wow, you have really, really been touched by the disease. So um, one of the things, you know, with your, your master's in social work, um, and you mentioned that you specialize in, in geriatrics now for more than 30 years, what has been one of the, the best parts about your work for you? Well, there have been several over the years, but I must say that the experience that I'm having now as the director of Alice's Clubhouse has uh, really been where I have seen that we can be more effective uh, assisting families directly um, by providing them with respite care during the day and then allowing their loved ones to still go home at night and keep them where they want to be in their own homes. So being in this particular position um, and having the help and the financial resources through the uh, Reddick family has allowed me to really experience on a firsthand level the difference that I can see in not only our members that are coming here, but also in their families. Wonderful. Now, you mentioned respite care, and I know that's one of our typical jargon words, but a lot of families still don't know what that means. Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, respite means getting some rest. That means that during the day when caregivers have been taking care of a loved one 24 seven, um, you know, nights, days, weekends, seven days a week, they really do start to experience a burnout. They become very um, depressed and isolated. They start losing friends because they're not engaging as much as they used to. So it's very, very important for caregivers to understand that taking time off is, is so important to them physically and mentally. And respite is giving them and allowing them to bring their loved ones to the day center during the day. Um, they can leave them here as long as eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, and let us take care of their loved one, knowing that they're being well taken care of and with the care and compassion that they also have for their loved ones um, that we can provide here. And then they can go off and do whatever they enjoy, whether it's just going home and taking a nap or going out to lunch with friends, whatever it is that they, they used to do. And I, I really stress the importance of caregivers identifying what it is that they do enjoy because then they will take that time that they have while their loved one is here um, and they have the reassurance that they're going to be taken care of properly, that they can go out and enjoy themselves and not have to worry about their, their loved one. And that is so very, very important. I wish that word was like rest it or, or something else that, that made more sense to people or, or rest you. 
um, because it, it is just a, one of those words that so many people don't understand until they step into this and then they find all these all this new jargon and stuff. Sometimes our words aren't, um, you know, real friendly to the to the average Joe out there just living their life. And, and it, I think it just complicates the process. And, and of course, that's not you. That's just everything in, in general. I think we do that a lot with uh, some of our, our medical jargon. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about caregiver burnout and is it is it really real and if so what are some of the signs that that a care partner might be getting burnt out yes caregiver burnout is very real um, when I was um, in school and I was getting my master's I conducted um, individual therapeutic counseling to caregivers and one of the things I found in, in my research and um, in that uh, program was that caregivers often pass before the individual with dementia because they do not take care of their own health care needs. Uh, they might have depression, they might have migraines, they develop heart disease, um, gastric disturbances, um, on and on because they are not only caregiving for that person, but they're also the doctor or the nurse or the, the appointment maker, the cook, the, the, the shopper for all the needs of things that the person needs for both of them. So they're wearing many hats while they're being a caregiver. So that's why it's so important that they do take time off for themselves because, again, it is not something that people just talk about caregiver burnout. It is real and it is happening to anyone who is caregiving for an individual that is requiring that 24 seven care who is, has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia, they need to take time off of themselves because if they're not there to take care of that person, then who will? So you really have to make sure that you are taking care of yourself, eating properly, getting the right amount of sleep. Um, everything from making your own doctor's appointments is critical to the care of, of yourself and your loved one that has dementia. It is so critically important. Um, and it's one of those things I think that sneaks up on people. I know it did me and I didn't know how burnt out I was until I like just hit rock bottom. And it was just, and, and when I say rock bottom, it was just, I was so exhausted, but I ended up getting together with friends, not because I wanted to, but because I wanted to get them off my back because they kept calling. And then I realized how empty I was because they filled me back up. And so sometimes I think we're moving so fast. We're trying to trying to do it all that we, we don't even know that we're empty. Do you see that being the case very often? Yes, I do. I see it frequently. And that's one of the ways that, that this day center is helping families. It's not only for the members that are coming here, but it's also for our caregivers. They might come in in the morning and say, you know what? You know, um, he was up five times last night. I didn't get any sleep. Um, it happens so frequently that they're, you can see it on their faces. You can see how depressed they may be getting. Um, I offer a uh, licensed clinical social worker uh, to do uh, individual counseling. And also we have a support group that meets once a month uh, to help caregivers see that they are not alone um, in their caregiving. And and we have a saying in, in one of my, my favorite social work sayings is that uh, you're all in the same boat phenomenon. And that is so true of caregivers that once they start to hear other people who say, you know, I, I feel guilty because my loved one is still here. I, I feel guilty if I don't want to go home. You know, those are things that it's only, you're only human. Other people feel the same way. So it's real important that caregivers reach out to other caregivers because they're all really experience the same thing. No matter what level their loved one may be at, we all know it's a progressive illness, but as the caregiving continues and goes on, they need to really take care of themselves. That is so true. The comfort that is gotten when, when you just know you're not alone, that you're not this odd egg because you just feel like you don't fit anywhere. And you know, you had mentioned about the lack of sleep too. I, I kind of, um, I remember even when I was pregnant with my daughter, 
um, before she was born, every two hours I was up. So I was like sleep deprived the, the, my whole pregnancy. And then when she arrived, it was the same thing. And I was like so exhausted, but you just, it, you just make it your new normal and you don't, you don't know what else to really do. And, and I think I felt that same way in caring for both my mom with dementia and my dad who had brain cancer with that. And now one question I'm kind of interested in is, is you had mentioned that there's a, a family that is um, actually owns Alice's Clubhouse. What, what made them decide to get into this space? Well, it's, it's a really interesting story. Um, I used to um, have my own business, South and Broad Elder Care Services, uh, when we lived in downtown Charleston. And I was um, in a an magazine, um, and there was an article in there about me. So um, David Avretic, um he gave the article to his father and uh, because his mother uh, suffers from Alzheimer's. And so his father read it and said that, you know, he would think about calling me because I would assist families um, who are, are trying to be caregivers of those with dementia. And it took um, him a year. <laughs> and he, he finally gave me a call and said he wanted to talk to me about getting some help with his wife. So when I met with uh, Mr. Avretic, um I said that I had been a director of a day center for seven years up in Connecticut and um, that there wasn't anything here. Uh, similar. And I had always had, it was my passion and my dream to be able to open one of these uh, someday. But, you know, it was something that I never really expected um, to, to, to happen because I understand uh, that it is a quite a process to go through. Well, um, as speaking with the family, with uh, David and his father, um, they said, well, let's see if we can't help you um, to, to make this a reality. And they really wanted some place for, you know, his mother, David's mother to attend. And they did not want to put her in a nursing home or one of the, uh, the memory care day cent or memory care uh, centers that they have here. So um, we started working, David and I started working together and we started looking at property. And that was uh, well over two years ago. And um, we, uh, uh, through much hard work and effort, were able to open Alice's Clubhouse. Um, it is named after his mother, Alice. Uh, she comes here four to five days a week. Um, both David and his father have seen a significant difference in um, not only Alice's um, demeanor, but also his father, because he's getting the rest that he needs during the day. And they bring her in um, and pick her up every day, and, and she's loving it. So I feel so very blessed and honored to be able to be a part of uh, such a, a center because we are one of a kind. We are the only one in South Carolina that has a medical component because we do have nurses, um, as well as the recreational aspect of it. The, we're working with student nurses. It is a very um, well-rounded program, person-center oriented. So through the, the grace of God and, and David and his family, we are able to to bring this program to the community. So we're, we're very excited, but it did come about in, in a roundabout way, but I'm, I'm so thankful and, and grateful that um, we were able to do this. That's absolutely a beautiful story. I mean, it's just fantastic. And I, I hear more and more um, where families have been touched in, in making change. I mean, that's what made me, I mean, I, I took my life savings, my retirement and everything to do what I do. And people go, are you crazy? And it's like, you know what, if, if people don't stand up and step in, we're never going to improve the situation. And, you know, there's great risk in terms of doing that. But I just, I, I just couldn't sit by and be part of a system that I thought was not, you know, reaching everybody that, that needs to be reached out there. And, um, and so kudos, kudos to the to the family and for you for for doing that. I, I just think it's absolutely marvelous. And um, you know, I was so impressed when I went on to the website. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But all of what you do and how, you know, you really are doing a lot of different things. And and um, when I read through, I just think of my memory cafe people in asking for support in some of those other areas. And and you know, I going down the list and it's like ting 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 you've got you really have them all so 
So good, good job. What steps can can family care uh, partners take to really help alleviate some of the pressures? What do they need? To- well, the the first thing they need to do is I would recommend uh, contacting um, elderly law attorneys. Um, financially, what they can afford is where I think that the stress for families right now is is cost. Um, they really need to understand what the finances are um, in regards to taking care of of their loved one. Obviously, you know, finding a, a geriatrician. Um, you take your children to pediatricians. I recommend that caregivers take their loved ones to a geriatrician um, because they specialize um, getting the person that is suspecting that they might have Alzheimer's. Um, They can um, conduct tests. Um, They can become part of studies. Um, We have an excellent um, uh, Roper Hospital here um, in Charleston um, that is also doing some research as well as MUSC, the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, Both hospitals are conducting research studies so that you could perhaps enroll your loved one in a research study and um, really help others who are are suffering from this as well. So really understanding financially what you can afford, what type of care you can afford, um, making sure that you get the proper diagnosis is extremely important. Taking it one day at a time, one step at a time. Um, I have offered my services to the community, even if they have a loved one and they're not sure about where to go um, or where to start, um, I am available for families if they want to come in and, and speak with me. I have a, a lot of community resource information. Um, if they're looking for home care, hospice, um, assisted living, memory care, if that whatever they think that they need, I can provide them with some information. Um, as a social worker, I always give them uh, three choices. I'm not going to say, well, you have to definitely go to this one or this one because I'm not sure exactly who they have or where they're at, who they have working for them at the time, especially with a home care. They need to interview the person who's coming into the home. But whatever they they do, they need to start somewhere. They need to be able to reach out um, to help get help um, via, you know, support groups. Um, They can attend our support group and we provide care for their loved one as long as we have advance notice at no charge. They can come in for a free support group and listen to what other people are finding out in our community. There is a wealth of information out there. So it's very, very important for families to understand that they can, you know, they can find that help, you know, via radio. I think this is great um, listening to your your podcast or, you know, on the on the Internet um, to get the help that they need. I'm glad that you mentioned the Internet, because I think that is one of the things that really has to be flipped in terms of mindset is that resources don't have to be in your backyard all the time. They don't have to be one-on-one and and that is uh, that just expands things so much. I also like that you you know talked about the the financial and the legal and, and getting a diagnosis so you know what you're dealing with. Um, but there are, you know, we were talking offline before and you know you had really talked about having um, a a care partner, basically giving themselves permission to ask questions and to take care of themselves. How do they do that? As far as taking care of themselves um, is just getting the time off, um, whether it be with a home care or having their loved ones come here. Um, Exercise is extremely important. Um, We used to have a diagram that we used in the in social work and it was like a pie chart and you really need to have all the pieces of the pie similar sizes if you don't exercise then you don't have that as part of your pie chart if you don't have spirituality so for some people that means that they go to church every Sunday or they can reach out to their pastor or their minister or the rabbi if they can have someone to talk to that's also extremely important eating properly, sleep, all of these important aspects, they need to be, all of those pieces need to be a part of your pie. Um, Socialization, socialization for the caregiver, speaking to friends, reaching out to people. 
that's such an important piece um, of of taking care of yourself. And um, I think that that is something that if people think of it in that respect, they can ask themselves, well, I'm not doing anything as far as, you know, taking care of my own health. I've never been to the doctor in a year. Then you need to understand that all of those pieces are important for you to take care of yourself. The other thing when I'm thinking about all of this is, you know, it really is about sometimes getting assertive and being able to set boundaries. Because one of the things I found, and again, I'd like to know if you see this with others, but because I was doing such a good job caring for my folks, then everybody else kind of stepped up and goes, well, Lori really does a good job. I think I'll have her take care of me and my needs and stuff too. And it just kept kind of piling on and piling on and piling on. And I ended up just being the fix-it person. And then others weren't really doing what they needed. And I was feeling the emotional drain of their issues where they where they weren't. Do you see that as being common? Yes, I do. Because some of my caregivers think, and like so many of us did when we had children, you know, nobody can take care of my children the way I can. And nobody can take care of my mom or my dad the way I can. But if they understand that they may have a, a sibling who is a nurse or a brother who might be an accountant, um, they can take some aspects of that caregiver um, that going back and forth, taking their loved one to the, to the doctor. If you can call upon, you know, some family. I think so many times I've heard from caregivers that, oh, my children are too busy. They can't take care of, you know, mom, the, you know, because they've got their own children to take care of. Well, that, that's true. Um, we call them the sandwich generation, the ones that are trying to take care of kids and their parents. Um, but if they could give them even um, a time on Saturday afternoon for the, the main caregiver to go out and just go uh, out to lunch one day a week, or if they could bring them flowers one, one time. I know that not everybody is built to be a caregiver. Not everyone has the care and compassion, the same as everyone else, not even within the family. There are some family members, especially, you know, most of it, as you know, it falls on the female in the family who, who take on the main uh, caregiving role. But it's really, really important for that person who's doing that caregiving to understand that they may not be able to come in and stay with that person for eight hours during the day, but that at least they could come over and bring you lunch one day a week or do something else for you that would be nice. Um, so there, there are other aspects to the caregiving role rather than what a lot of people think of as just the hands-on care. You know, they're not built to, you know, go in and give showers and cook and clean and do all those things that the, 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 the primary caregiver does. But there are other things that they can do for you as well. Well, and one of the things that, that I learned with my own family, um, and, it, and I didn't learn this until after my dad died, when we were sharing stories, was that with all of that care, and I mean, I knew this was happening, but I just didn't, I guess I didn't rationalize out the difference. And I knew that my brothers weren't coming around, but what came out was that I had all these beautiful stories that they didn't have. And, you know, when I was angry at them for not helping and not being like me, which I think is kind of a common trait of the primary caregiver feeling isolated and alone, um, we had this great discussion that came into, you know, well, I saw myself as organized and they saw myself as a, uh, they saw me as a control freak. And so we kind of laughed about that and, you know, why they stayed away was because they didn't feel that they could meet, you know, my expectations, which was partially true. It was also much easier. So I said, I'd take some of the blame, but they could have had the conversation with me earlier. But it wasn't until they heard my stories and, and these just meaningful things um, that I really think that they felt the loss and that I really felt saddened for them. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that was just a really powerful powerful exchange and it made me look at them very differently because I just I just felt so I, I my heart just felt so sad for them yeah that, that is so true and and that reminds me of when I was in school and I had a professor of mine say that they the primary caregiver 
can really rob people of the, of the other siblings of having the experience of really enjoying some of those moments that they're never going to get the chance to have again. And he stressed the importance of making sure that there is proper and good communication, especially in families. And we see that all the time, especially in our very transient society where people are living all over the country. And I hear that, well, I can't do anything because I don't live there. Well, you can make a phone call. You know, you can send, you know, um, monies for whatever supplies they might need. Um, there are certain things that you can do because if you don't and if you are one of those siblings who withdrew and said, I'm, I can't do anything, they have it all covered, I don't need to worry about it, then years down the road, that that will affect you. You'll start to think about it and say, you know what, I didn't do the right thing. And it may not happen right after, but, but you know, the person is gone. But trust me, years down the road, when you're thinking back on what you could have and couldn't and didn't do, then that will that will affect you. So I think that everybody just needs to take a step back, really communicate, let people know. Sometimes people don't know what to do. They really don't. You know, they'll say, well, I wanted to help, but I didn't know how to help. And that is really up to the primary caregiver to step up and say, you know what, I need you to take this person, your mother or your father, to the doctors once a week. Or I need help going with the grocery shopping. Anything, give them concrete ideas. Don't just say, well, you know, we'll bring over, you know, something for you next week. Make it specific. Because if you don't, then it, more than likely it won't happen. But that person that's not helping will definitely be affected by that as the years go by and the person is no longer here. Oh, I, I totally agree. And I think in, in my family situation, I wasn't specific. And part of it, you know, and this just occurred to me now, um, and my mom's been gone for, you know, like uh, five years now, my dad almost 20. And I what just hit me when you were saying that was uh, part of it was I think I didn't want to appear weak, you know, and, and because everyone always looked at me as the strong one in the family. And so I would throw it out there, but I, but I didn't give as specifics as I should have to really get them to, to engage. And I, I think that's really important. I also think that, um, you know, you had mentioned, you know, they could send money to help out support. They could, they could be on the phone. I really want to educate people on the power of video too. And, you know, for me, um, on, on my journey with my mom, it was extremely, a, a, it ended up being an extremely spiritual journey. And she was coming to me at dreams in dreams before she died. And she actually told me I would not be there when she was passing. And I'm like, but I'm always the one that's there, you know? And she was like, no, I need you gone because I need them to experience this. And so I, um, you know, about four months later, my mom passes and where am I? I'm in Arizona speaking and I'm leaving when she's actively dying. My family thinks I'm having a nervous breakdown other than my daughter that knows, nope, this is what grandma wants. And I did not realize, I thought I would stay in contact via the phone. And I was, um, I, I ended up um, really being one with all of them, but not hands-on through video. And it was one of the most powerful tools, even when she's in her end stages and, you know, can't communicate and is actively dying. I could, with one of my brothers, put him in place when he was out of line through video because no one else would stand up to him and then kind of break that tension. I could guide them on how to care for her without being hands on to do it. And it was, it was just um, uh, one of the most powerful things I have ever experienced in my entire life. And even when uh, my mom and I had this pact about, you know, she wanted, she wanted to make sure that I would carry on. And that was another reason she didn't want me there. Um, so I called, you know, right before I was going to take the stage one time. And she, I said, mom, you got 10 minutes to be here. You know, we're in this together. And when I got up on stage, I 
actually was blinded by this bright light that just it took over everything and I tripped and I almost fell on stage. And at that moment, I didn't know if she had passed or if she arrived. And then I called afterwards and um, it was probably, you know, it took me 15 minutes to get off stage and go to someplace quiet. And my daughter says, mom, it was the weirdest thing. When you told grandma, you know, she's got 10 minutes to be there. Her body got so hot and so red and we couldn't cool her down till about 15 minutes ago. And I said, that's when I got off the stage. And it was just, wow. I mean, I've no, that's amazing. story after story after story. I, I mm. actually got to see her take her last breath mm, you know, that's um, wonderful. and do these vigils. And it was, it was so, it was so good for all of us to be there, but it was, it was a really good decision for me not to be there because my mom was always big on death and dying and people need to not be afraid of this. And mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah. so video yeah. is, is very, very powerful. Uh, let's yeah. talk about the medical um, model that you have for your memory care, um, mm -hmm. you know, day center. Tell us what, what does that really mean and how, do, how are you different from everyone else? Well, the medical model that we have is um, we employ um, RNs um, that can administer medication. Um, since we have opened about six months ago, we've had a couple of people who are requiring um, a little bit of anti-agitation medicine at the end of the day. Um, as we all know, the sundowning, um, sometimes that can start as the illness progresses. So we um, work in conjunction with the physicians. Um, we can fax their medical paperwork um, back and forth um, to make sure that we are in regulation with the DHEC regs. We are state regulated so that we have specific guidelines that we have to follow. So we also have what we call our little wellness center. Um, it is a, a room where we can have uh, Fox Rehab coming in to conduct physical um, occupational therapies. We have a speech therapist. Uh, audiologist, uh, podiatrist, um, the um, hairdresser, anything that our families need to maintain a good quality of life, we have with our um, with our building. Um, that's why it is different from others that we try to provide additional services. Um, if there is a physician that wants to see one of the members here or meet with the families, we have a room specifically for the the doctor so that they can meet with them. Um, we have a room where we have uh, computers set up that if our um, RN, we have RN student nurses, if they want to conduct research with utilizing our members, um, we are working towards getting that into our building as well. Um, we do have student nurses um, that I, I believe is extremely important to have um, RNs who are trained in working in this field and specifically with individuals with dementia. So it is a very, very structured program. Um, we offer uh, two snacks and a lunch uh, every day catered by our dish and design caterer so that we have employed a dietitian to make sure that we meet all the federal requirements um, and guidelines um, that are required um, by um, the government to make sure that our seniors are getting the um, protein that, the, that they need um, to really maintain a good quality of, of life for, for themselves. So it, it really is nothing like this here um, that can provide all these different services under one roof. And um, I'm trying to take as many things away from the families as possible um, so that they don't have to worry about taking their loved one to all these different appointments. They can have those services provided here. You know, sometimes family members, and I was one of them, you know, my mom always liked going to see her doctor, but it got to a point where it was very difficult and she got so anxious. And so getting those um, services in the setting they're in are, I, I believe, is so critical and it's life changing to decrease some of that agitation because now it's just another friend in their own environment that they're that they're seeing. I, there's so many things that I love about your model that I really truly hope that you will fill out that World Dementia Council survey because I, I think 
this is a model that works, I think it's important on so many different levels because uh, you know we don't have enough services and we don't have um, people don't have the the finances and they don't have the support. You've really pulled so much together in your entity. I love that you call it Alice's Clubhouse instead of an adult day program because nobody nobody wants to go you know to an adult day and feel like they're being babysat and that's the, the connotation that we hear over and over again from that so it sounds like fun you um having all those uh, the, the, that access to a variety of doctors from you know an audio to foot care to whatever it might be that their needs are and doing the research, I love that you're combining that. I don't know if you are aware of the A-list through Us Against Alzheimer's, um, but that is a, is a research project that they have ongoing, and it's pretty simple where people can either take it online, and it's usually only a few questions. No, I'm not aware of that one. Okay, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll send you some information um, okay. for that. I think that that would be a, a nice addition too, and it's just real simple. I also wanted to ask you about one of the things that I hear so much about is what do I do when my, my person is being labeled with, with behaviors? And you had talked about sundowning. People don't, not everyone knows what sundowning is. But how, how do you work with behaviors? You know, I'm really big on trying to even get rid of that word and, and get people to call them, you know, reactions and triggers for us to kind of dig deeper. How, how do you deal with sundowning and, and behaviors? Well, the, for the most part, it is keeping the um, individual engaged. Um, when, and as you know, and I'm sure you're aware, all the five senses diminish when someone has dementia. And... So as the disease progresses, they really um, get to the point where they want more tactile stimulation. They want to be able to touch things, feel different materials. Um, it is very important to keep them engaged. And one of the best ways to do that and to decrease those challenging behaviors is with music. Um, we have a recreational therapist who plays a guitar and sings. One of our nurses plays classical piano. Those types of, of music that we in, incorporate into our program are critical. And even if you're at home, I encourage families to keep the music on. You find out what it was, what kind of music they liked to listen to when they were younger, and then that's what you would put on to help decrease that type of behavior. Um, as a, uh, we have a pet therapist that comes in. Many of them had dogs. They had pets, so they really like to engage in, in petting. Um, we have, I think we have three different dogs, four different dogs that come in now a week who um, really, the, the, the members here really love to pet and engage in conversation with it. They really enjoy that. Uh, children, um, if you have grandchildren, if you have you know, programs that you can take your loved one to. They love, love children. Um, and again, having any type of music incorporated into that. We have incorporated a, an art therapy program. So our rec therapist has them engaged in painting uh, different, different um, pictures. And you'd be amazed at what some of them still know and can do. Um, because if they were artists or if they enjoyed that when they were younger, um, that's what, what they will enjoy now. We have a 20-page assessment that we do on individuals that do come into the day center. So we want to know what they like to do prior to um, the, getting the illness. Uh, one of the ladies was, uh, she was in textile and, and buyer for in New York for the fashion industry. Well, we, we want to incorporate into our program, that's why we call it a person-centered program, whatever that she liked to do prior to, then we're going to incorporate that into into what what we do here, so that we can keep that that person engaged. I love that you had uh, mentioned that some of the the senses lessen, and I guess I, I'm just going to make a comment on that because I I talk with a lot of people living with dementia, and many of them say that some of their senses, not all, um, have have gotten more vivid. So sound for some, and and I think with each of them, you know, it, it's 
it, it varies because when you met one person with dementia, you've met one, but some of them talk about being more sensitive to sound or temperature changes or with Lewy body, their, their body can fluctuate with temperature changes too. Or um, touch, I know my mom, for example, she, uh, and, and this is I think a very common one as well, where all of a sudden she doesn't want to take a shower or a bath, um, the, the shower hurts her skin and Tipa Snow was the one that told me that, you know, the fat pads lessen. And I said, well, my mom's a big woman. She says it has nothing to do with being heavy or thin. It has to do with the, the nerves um, are, are coming up front um, to the skin. And so the power of that water really can hurt, literally. And so she recommended using, you know, rain shower heads and things like that. So I, I, I find it really interesting how the senses change. In fact, I did a a talk where I interviewed a woman um, on that for a intensive that we did at a conference and people were just amazed at the changes because I think everyone for the most part thinks everything is always the same and it and it truly it truly isn't and I just want to give you you know a minute if you want to rebut anything no no I agree um you know when you have seen one person with dementia you've seen one person with dementia they all can progress at different levels and they all have a you know uh different uh, changes but as far as um, the shower we provide showers here as well I know in my other center I used to have sons who did not for obvious reasons want to bathe their mother so we we started providing showers so when we built this center we also um, provide showers um, for those that are resistant that's very common they don't want to get into the the shower and if you think about some of the people in some of the ages when they were if they're 80, 90 years old, well, they didn't shower every day. That My grandmother used to call it taking a little bird bath when she got older. So, you know, they, they don't really go into that that easily, but obviously for to have some quality of life, we like to provide that. And usually they are better for other people. That's why I recommend to the families, if you are having a difficult time getting them in the shower, then, you know, there are different articles online and things you can read about how to do that. But if they're still resistant, then let someone else do it. Because usually, like children, sometimes are better for other people. Um, hearing and sight. You know, we all decrease, um, have that issue when we're, we get older with our hearing and, and, and our eyes. But one of the things that I want to stress, um, and especially, and this is going out to any physicians that might be listening, is that, it is very, very important when they, obviously, when they come into the day center here that they're able to engage in these programs that they can see and then they can hear. Um, I, I find it that I've had people coming in say, well, you know, the doctor says that, you know, my mother, she has dementia, so we're not going to give her a hearing aid now, or her sight is bad, or she has dementia, we're not going to do anything about that. You know, that's that can be, you know, detrimental to that person because, Maybe they're not engaging because they can't see or they're not participating because they can't hear. So we used to keep the hearing aids and the glasses at our other, the other day center. And, you know, because if they were coming there five days a week and then if the families wanted to take them home, they were more than <laughs> willing, you know, they could, they could, obviously they could take them home. But it was really important for the, you know, that person to have that um, when they were at the day center because they might have been more lethargic and wanting to fall asleep all the time just because they couldn't hear what the program was. And I know those things can be lost in, in a heartbeat. We all know with people with dementia, sometimes they like to move things around. My mother's favorite thing was to hide the remote, which drove us all crazy. But we really you know, need to think about how we address all of those, um, those uh, declines in all their senses. And the other thing would be in the taste. Mom, my mother used to love sweets donuts, cookies, candy, and of course, since she became a borderline diabetic, um, so that wasn't wasn't a good thing, but one of the things that you can do and to decrease the, the salt intake is we used to put Mrs. Dash in salt shakers, and then when the person, because they were so used to picking up that salt shaker and sprinkling on their food, because their taste buds have declined, so they, they need to have that, and that's why they love their sweets, because it has more of a taste to it than something like mashed potatoes or, or a pork chop. So I, um, I think that that's really important for families to recognize that it's not that the person may not be eating everything on their plate, 
um, or they're only eating one side of the plate, but they may only be seeing one side of the plate, or this food might be the same color. So I recommend turning the plate so that people can can see the entire dish, and so maybe that will help um, when they're having some difficulty getting them to eat. So it is important for families to educate themselves, and uh, along with all their other jobs, um, to understand that they're not doing this on purpose. They're not, um, you know, um, acting out on purpose. It's so important to remember not to be angry at the person, um, and um, and you know, if you want to be angry at anything at the illness, because it is a very, very difficult, very difficult illness and a challenge for for many families who are struggling out there to try to take care of a loved one. You know, that's a really good point in terms of the, the sight and the hearing that I think people, you know, people go with whatever the doctors tell them to do um, so often, but a lot of times our doctors aren't educated enough um, and as deeply as they need to be, in my opinion, in this day and age on this topic because yeah, if you can't hear and if you can't see, you are going to be withdrawn or you are going to misconstrue what is happening um, around you. And just think of how fearful life would be if you couldn't see and you couldn't hear, um, how different, you know, we would react. Um, so they're really, uh, you know, make it just makes a lot of sense. Simple things like even having a colored plate for food for contrast so they can see and, um, you know, those little simple exercises of even just, you know, putting your your fingers in a in a circle to see, you know, to just get rid of um, the peripheral and just being able to see that tunnel vision, which many of them, many of them have, and is very common. Just again, even when we age. Um, so this is this has been just such a great conversation. In wrapping up, why should caregivers be sure to take time for themselves and to get the help that they need? because it is critical not only to themselves but for the person they're caregiving for because you really if you are stressed you're not getting your sleep you're depressed you're you're very anxious the person with dementia really does have a sixth sense we sometimes don't give them credit for what they know they and or feel they do understand to a certain level if someone is looking at them and saying don't do this and don't do that and no and no and no and no, they're also going to become more agitated. They could become more aggressive, more physically aggressive. They could become, you know, more more anxious themselves. So it's very important for that caregiver to get help, take some time off. Do it for yourself, but also do it for that person that you're caregiving for. Because it's very easy to lose your temper. You're only human. Um, it's very understandable to feel guilty. I, I had one individual who said she felt so guilty because she was constantly yelling at her mother not to do things when she kept, you know, emptying out the, or she would put the clean dishes with the dirty dishes, or, you know, she would, you know, do things, you know, repetitively, and her daughter was starting, she's, I'm starting to lose my mind, she just keeps doing this. Well, remember, the only thing that you can control is what you do. If she is having difficulty with her putting the dishes away, and then it's uh, it's time to move on to something else. If you find that your your mother or your father keeps putting uh, clothes um, and taking all the clothes out of the closet and putting them in suitcases and saying, I want to leave, I hear that story. I've heard that one more than once. Then you need to remove the suitcase out of the room, and you need to give them a limited amount of clothes to put in their closet and get them the same clothes. Uh, two or three sets of, you know, the same color of pants and the same color shirt. These are things that you can control. You cannot always control what that person does. But if you find that they're doing these repetitive behaviors and it's causing you to start to become angry and depressed and unable to sleep, then it's time that you get get help. And it's time you reach out and be able to talk to someone that can help you. And the, the other question I often get is, how do I know when it's time that, I, you know, I just, I just can't do this anymore? And one lady told me, she said, when I, I pull up to the front of my house and I know that he's in there and I don't want to go in, that's when you say, you know, I need to start getting help. No one can do this alone. No one. It, it really does 
take a village. It does take a lot of people that are, you know, helping you uh, through this process. And it does change, like we said, it's a progressive illness. So when one day works, maybe the next day it won't. But I would encourage everyone to to reach out for help because it's definitely a, a challenge um, with uh, with Alzheimer's. And um, but there, the good news is when when I started this 30 years ago, there there weren't all these websites and podcasts and videos and and all that. There, it just wasn't existing. And now there is. So. It really to make the time for yourself. It's, it's extremely important. Great advice uh, for me. With I'll just give an example of a tool I developed called Your Memory Chip. Um, I was one of those daughters that wasn't so gracious when my mom would repeat herself 45 times in in 10 minutes. And I was like, I got stuff to do, you know. And and I remember snapping at her one time, and I just thought, oh, she doesn't deserve that. You know, I I need to be a more gracious daughter. What's wrong with me? And I won't go into the whole story of this tool, but I ended up shifting from focusing on my checklist, which is what I think most people do. You know, they have this list of tasks that they have to do to focusing first on was she safe? Was she happy? Was she pain free? And when I, when my true focus was on that, because I, I had to be totally relationship based. I, you know, it was all about how am I making her feel? Not what am I doing for her? The doing for her, what I found was uh, made me feel better because the, you know there's no cure, there really isn't anything that that helps. So that made I, I realized that was some of those things on the checklist were there for me, not necessarily for her, yeah, um, even though they were all about her. But shifting that mindset to a heart set of is she safe, is she happy, is she pain free, made me um, realize that I could still be her daughter that I could still sit and laugh or hold her hand or just sit in silence and, and be grateful for her presence. And that was life changing for me. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Now people can get a hold of you by going to your website, Alice's uh, clubhouse.com, Alice's clubhouse.com, or they can email you at Diane at Alice's clubhouse.com. And are you comfortable giving out a phone number? Um, sure. The, the phone number mm-hmm. is 843-284-8367. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your time, Diane. And, and well, thank, thank you, Lauren. And I thank your family who, you know, is backing this. I just, I, I think this is absolutely fantastic. So okay. again, check out alicesclubhouse.com. I think you'll be really impressed if you go visit that website of all the different things that they provide. And you can just uh, tell from Diane's uh, voice, you know, how committed she is and the compassion just kind of rolls and e- uh, oozes out of you. So again, thank you for all you do. Well, well, thank you, and thank you for having me today. In wrapping up, I am just going to mention a couple other organizations you might not be aware of. Uh, Maria Shriver has the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. They're going to have a big event this November for Move for the Minds. You can go to thewomensalzheimersmovement.org for more information on that. You might also be interested in the Roberto app. The Roberto app actually measures your brain function and you play some games. It's pretty cool. And they're introducing this to um, all levels from schools to businesses uh, to people concerned about their memory. And then the A list, which is connecting families to research to better understand the needs of those living with dementia. This is the one that I had mentioned to Diane when we were talking earlier. You can go to usagainstalzheimers.org, that's usagainstalzheimers.org, and then go forward slash networks, and then forward slash a dash list. And as always, we have tons of resources on alzheimerspeaks.com. Don't forget to visit our initiatives and projects page. Thank you so much, everyone, and have an amazing week. Bye now. Hi, everyone. This is Meredith from the Senior Fitness with Meredith podcast, where I discuss all things for seniors. From fitness, your health and wellness journeys, how to be all over strong and beyond. I also have my mini podcast called Motivation with Meredith. It's a great, quick, motivational pick-me-up for your days. 
Join me, listen now, search for Senior Fitness with Meredith on your favorite podcast platform.